Welcome to Close Listening, WPS1's program of readings and conversations presented in collaboration with Penn Sound. Our guest today is Thomas McEvely. Thomas McEvely directs the new art criticism and writing program at SVA, the School for Visual Arts, here in New York. His most recent book is The Triumph of Anti-Art, Conceptual and Performance Art in the Formation of Postmodernism. His other books include The Shape of Ancient Thought, Art and Discontent, Art and Otherness, and The Exile's Return Toward a Redefinition of Painting for the Postmodern Era, and a poem novel, North of Yesterday. <laughs> My name is Charles Bernstein. On today's show, Thomas McEvely will be reading classical Greek poetry. Uh, hello there. Uh, this is Thomas McEvely. I'm going to be reading some passages from ancient Greek poetry aloud in Greek. And one reason is because you know, what you might call discriminating readers for thousands of years have felt that this poetry had an extraordinarily high achievement of musical sound, metrical musical sound. But I don't want you just to be listening to sound, so I'm also going to read either translations of the passages which I will read or just tell you briefly what they are about. Now, in... Greek poetry, I mean, and, and perhaps one might say in poetry in general, uh, Homer really takes pride of place. It was Homer, you know, that Ezra Pound in, I think, Guide to Culture said, was the poet who had everything. The way in music, he said, Bach has everything. So I'm going to read first the beginning, the first passage of Homer's Iliad and in order to remind you of what it's about, I will first read a, a few lines of Alexander Pope's classic translation. Achilles' wrath to Greece the direful spring of woes unnumbered heavenly goddess sin. That wrath which hurled to Pluto's gloomy reign the souls of mighty chiefs untimely slain, whose limbs unburied on the naked shore, devouring dogs and hungry vultures tore, since great Achilles and Atrides strove. Such was the sovereign doom, and such the will of Jove." Of course, Pope's great translation is in a very strict English rhymed meter. Greek didn't use rhyme, and Greek used a much more complex meter. Homer, the Homeric meter was it basically it's a six-foot line, and each line is comprised of two stresses. The first stress always has to be a single long syllable, what we call a spondy, but the second stress can appear as either a single long syllable or two short syllables, so this makes the uh, this substitution possibility makes the meter extremely flexible and muscular. Okay. Now, you know, in, in English is a language where grammar is based on word order and you know generally the subject comes first then the verb then the object but in Greek which is a different type of language the words can come in any order and Homer chose to begin the two great epics with single words which express the theme of the whole poem and in terms of the Iliad the first word is main in wrath rage, anger. The first three words of the Iliad are menin ayedethea, that is, wrath, sing, goddess. Menin ayedethea, pelea do achilleas, ula menin e muria kaios, og ethaken, Polas dif 
Ti mus psukasa i di proyapsin, hero on autuste heloria teuke cunesin, oi o noisi te passi, di aste teleate bule, ex hude ta prota di aste ten erasante, a treades te anax andron kai tia sakilaus. I should mention that ancient Greek had a both a pitch accent and a qualitative, quantitative meter, and I'm not reading it that way. I'm reading it as if it were in the qualitative meter, but nevertheless, the meters, uh, as I read them, are all correct. They're, they can be read in two or three different ways which are correct. And this is one of them. Now let's go to the second book of the Iliad. I once gave myself a, an assignment uh, to memorize the first ten lines of every book of the Iliad, and I don't remember them all anymore. But this is the beginning of book two, when uh, all the gods and men are asleep, and then... People start to wake up and trouble starts. Aloi men hrothe oi tekai honores hippocarustai, herdon panuki oi dia dukek in nedumas hupnos, al hoge me me ridze katafrena husaki lea, ti me se o le se de poyasepi nelsen akayon. He did a hoi cut a thum on a wrist day fine it I boule, pimps I ep atria de agamemnon e ulan on eran, kai min phone sa sepe ap terawenta proseode. So Agamemnon begins to get the bad dream. Now I would like us to switch to the tenth book. The tenth book of the Iliad is the darkest, uh, the Dolonea, in which Odysseus and Diomedes set a, the entire book takes place at night. When it starts, again, everyone is asleep, and then they start to wake up and s- scheme trouble. And Odysseus and Diomedes go to the sneak in the night to the camp of the Thracians who have come to reinforce Troy and who are encamped outside and they slaughter them in their sleep. Now beside the ships all the other chieftains of the host of the Achaeans were slumbering. But Agamemnon, son of Atreus, shepherd of the host, was not beholden to sweet sleep. Aloi men para nelsin ariste es panakaion, held dan panukioi malakoi de deme mena hoopno. All who got traedain agamemnon a poimen a la on hoopna seke glucaras, pull a fress in hor my nonta. Host hot on astrap. Te posis he res e u camoio, te con e polin ombro na sthesvatan e a kaladzen, e nifatan od e pertekion e palu on a ruras, e a pothib tolemoio, magastum a perke de noio, hos pukin enste thesin a penanestic kidze a memnon, neothin ek cradies trome onto de frehoi frenasentas. Now, uh, well, these poems are very long, of course. Now, let's get on. There's a lot I want to present to you today. So, we've seen the dark beginnings of the Iliad. The Odyssey, Homer's other poem, or the poem that came out of what's called the Homeric tradition, was very different in mood and ideology. Uh, The great 19th century author Samuel Butler 
once made the beautifully witty remark that the Odyssey is the Iliad's wife. The Iliad is a relentlessly masculine poem about rage and war. The Odyssey is trying to get back home and become an ordinary citizen and head of a family again. And in the first word of the Odyssey is Andra, man. In other words, the first word of the Odyssey announces that, unlike the Iliad, it is an essentially humanistic poem. Andra moi enepe musa, the man, tell me, muse. Tell me the man of many turnings who wandered full many ways after he had sacked the sacred citadel of Troy. Many were the men whose cities he saw and whose minds he learned, and many the woes he suffered in his heart upon the sea, seeking to win his own life back and the return of his comrades. Yet even so he saved not his comrades, though he desired it, for through their own blind folly they perished fools who devoured the kind of Helios Hyperion and he took from them the day of their return. Andra moi enepe musa polutra pon hos malapola plunk theepe troyes here on ptoliethron a person. Polon don thropon eden ostia kaino an egno pola do hen Panto pathen algea hon karathumon ar numenas hen tepsu ken kai nustan hetairon. All ud hos heterus er rusito hi amenas per auton gar sveteresin atastaliesin alonto nepioi hoi katabus huperianos e elioio estian autarho toisin afelato nostimon emar. He took away from them the day of their return. Now, let's go ahead to book five and look at the moment when Odysseus is sitting on the beach on Calypso's island longing for home. And Zeus decides, looking down from heaven, that it's time for Odysseus to be allowed to go home, and he sends Hermes down to tell Calypso to let him go. So saying, the strong Argea Fontes, that's Hermes, departed, and the queenly nymph went to the great-hearted Odysseus when she had heard the message of Zeus. Now here's the famous moment. Him she found sitting on the shore, and his eyes were never dry of tears, and his sweet life was ebbing away as he longed mournfully for his return. Hosara phone sas up a bay crotis arge fontes. He depodice a megalatera potnia numfe. E e a pe de zena se peclu and angelia on. Ton darep ac tes heroc a themen on ude put or se. Dacru a fin ter son to catebata de glucus ion. Noston oduro menon epe uceti hindane numfe. Listening to Thomas McEvely on WPS1's Close Listening. So, uh, let's listen to Sappho for a minute. After Homer, the next great age of Greek poetry was the age of the lyric poets, and the meter that they used was very different. The Homeric meter was based on substitution. You could, in the second beat of each metrum, you could switch two shorts for one long, but not in Sappho. The sapphic meter is an aeolic meter. It's a different dialect, a different tradition. Uh, and it sounds more or less like this. Boom, ba boom, 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 ba boom, ba boom, boom. 
That's the sapphic line. Here is Sappho, fragment one, when she invokes Aphrodite, splendid throned immortal Aphrodite. Poi kilo throna thonat Aphrodita, pai diasto lo ploke lissomai se, me masaisi made on eisi damna pot. Thuman. Alla tweed elf I potecata rota, tas emas audas a usa peloi, eclues patros de doman lepoisa, cruce on elfes. Harm who pax dex saisa caloi de sagon, o que estru thoi perigas malinas, pugna dinen tes perap ora, o theras dia meso. I psadex si conta sud o macaira, me di ai sais arthonato prosopo, e re hati deote peponte corti deote calemi. Corti moi malista thelogen es thy, mine ala thu mo tina delte petho, absagen es one philotata tis so psaf adikeye. Kai gar ai feo ge take osti oxe, ai dora medeket ala dorse, ai de me file take os file se, cuc ethalusa. Elthe moi kai nun kalapon de luson, ek merimnan ose de moi telesai, thu mas hi mere teleson su tauta, sumakas eso. So, okay, let's get on with it. Perhaps the high point, really, I mean, I know Homer gets pride of place, but in a sense the high point in all Greek poetry is are the choruses of Aeschylus's play, the Agamemnon. And at first I want to read you the opening lines, which are not by the chorus, but by a servant. Interesting that the opening lines would be spoken by a servant who is lying on the top of the house of Agamemnon's house waiting for the beacon light to show him that Troy has fallen. And he says, Theus men aito tonda palagain ponon, I beseech the gods for surcease from this toil. These endless nights lying on the roof of Agamemnon's house like a dog, and so on. Theus men aito tonda la pain ponon, Furas eteas mekas hen koi momenas stegai sa tredon onka then kunasti kain astron katoida nukteron homegorin kai tus ferontas kema kai theras protois lamprus dunastas emprepontas aetheri as deras hotanthinos in antelaistiton kai nun philoso lampatas to symbolan augain peras Ferusan ek troyas fatin, halosi mante baxin hodegar crate, gunaikas andra bulan el pizon kear. Then, of course, the signal comes. Agamemnon is coming home. Uh, Clytemnestra is planning to murder him as soon as he arrives. And, uh, The chorus, which is made up of the old men, because, you know, old men, the idea is they, they're retired, they got time on their hands, they just kind of stand around observing things in the public square and commenting on them. But here, they are shaken by the horror of what they sense is about to happen. Clytemnestra's sacrifice of Agamemnon, uh, and the chorus sings to Zeus and Night. O Zeo Basileo, kai nux filia, megalon cosmon ktea terra. 
Pet epitroi os pur gois ebale stegenon dictronus mate megan mate un eron tu pertelosai megas duleas. They foresee the horror that is about to happen, and later in the chorus, the old men say, uh, Lipusa das toisin as pisturas, clonus lokis mus decai, now batas hoplismos. See, uh, Greek meters were, uh, had a lot of potential for musical development, and uh, n- has nothing quite to equal uh, the choruses of the Agamemnon in that sense. We're going on to Stasimon 2, Chorus 2. The terrible events haven't happened yet, but the old men are fearful, and they say, uh, whoever said this horrible thing? Tisporon emads en hodes topane te tumos, me tisontin u karomen pro nois, I see tu papromenu, glosan en tu kanemon, tadarigam bronam fine, ke thelanan epe prepontos. Helenas, Helandras, Helep. Tullis. See, they're talking about Helen, Helen of Troy, and the, cor- the old men make a series of puns on her name. Helenas, Helandras, Heleptolis, that she is the prison, she is the death of men, she is the destruction of cities. All of this is taken from her name. And then, finally, the, you know, the terrible events happen, and uh, uh, the old men are can't quite bear it and they it's like they're they're standing awake but it's like they're having a bad dream and they say what is this thing that stands before me dripping grief like drops of blood from my heart tip to moi to dem padon de ma prostiterion, cardias paroscapon potatae, Montipole da calusta sa mista sa oida, urapaptusa de can duscriton or ne reton, tharsas eo pethes idze franas filan frenon. Okay, now we're going on. Uh, and the old men are reflecting upon the fact that once the blood has fallen, once dark blood has fallen on the ground, it cannot be called back. And in the verse, in the rhythm and music of the verse, you can like hear this kind of dripping. Tore begun person apox dona simon proper andras melanheim atison paul in uncolosite epahedon Then the chorus, the old men begin to lament about the madness of Helen, which caused her for the sake of her own whim and desire to cause the downfall of a civilization. They say, Eo paranus Helena. Paranus is our word paranoid. It means beside your mind, outside your mind. Eo paranus Helena. Mea tas polas, tas panu polas, psuchas alosas upotroia, nun de taleon palum nasta nepenthi so, di haima niptin etis ain potenda mois, eris erid matas andras oid zeus. And finally, the old men just fall to lamenting. They say, Fell, fell, kakan ein anateras to kanakarestu. Io, ie, di ai, di as, panai, ti u, paner, geta, tigar, bratois, anu, di as, tilei, 
Ti tond u theo cronten estin. Io, io, basileo, basileo, posse da cruso, frenus ec filias ti porepo, que side a rock ne sep who faz mati tond, a sebe thonato beyond ec pneon. O moi, moi, coi, ton, ton, dona Lutheran, to leo maro da mes, ec caras amphitamo bellamno. Now, okay, we've got a minute left. Uh, I'm going to read you a little poem by Meleager of Gadara, a later poet, what's called an epigram. Meleager, being murdered, leaves a note for the police. This is my translation. I pray you, Eros, in the name of my muse, I pray you, oh, let me sleep and forget for a while this lust for Heliodora. My God, I pray by your bow, which doesn't know how to shoot at anyone else, but day and night sinks shafts of screams in me. All right, no more prayers, you son of a bitch. You won't get away with it. With my last strength, I write this note for the police. It was love. Love killed me. Que Rousseau tona rota tona agrian arti gar arti, or thrinas ex coitas o catapoptemenas. Esti de ho pais cuco de cusa elias o cusa thambes, si magalon pero eis nota for retrofaras. Patras duque de co fraudzentinas ute gar aither. Uk thon feci te ken ton thrusen u pelagas. You've been listening to Thomas McEvely reciting classical Greek poetry at the Clock Tower Studio in Lower Manhattan. Our program was recorded on April 29, 2006. Close Listening is a production of WPS1.org in collaboration with Penn Sound. For more information on this show, visit our website, writing.upenn.edu slash pensound. This is Charles Bernstein assuring you that close listening is Greek to me. Welcome to Close Listening, WPS1's program of readings and conversations presented in collaboration with Penn Sound. Our guest today is Thomas McEvely. Thomas McEvely directs the new Art Criticism and Writing Program at the School for Visual Arts here in New York. His most recent book is The Triumph of Anti-Art, Conceptual and Performance Art in the Formation of Postmodernism. His other books include The Shape of Ancient Thought, Art and Discontent, Art and Otherness, The Exile's Return Toward a Redefinition of Painting for the Postmodern Era, and a poem novel, North of Yesterday. My name is Charles Bernstein. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hi, Charles. Glad to be here. It's great to have you back to back with that fantastic reading of Greek poetry. I I'm going to yeah. start in a little bit different track, but let me start there. Mm-hmm. How did a scholar of classical philology get involved in contemporary art criticism? Well, I don't want to take up our whole 27 minutes with my answer, but uh, <laughs> it, it could. Uh, the thing is, when I uh, when I was going to college and graduate school, uh, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to study because uh, I just wanted to do my own thing. And it seemed to me that the uh, field that would really enable you to do your own thing the most was the classics. I mean, I didn't really enter... The, I, I got a PhD in... Uh, classical philology, but I didn't really do it with the intention of becoming an academic you for know, the rest a, of my life. You know, to a post-60s person with do-your-own-thing emerges, the idea of studying the classics would not be immediately identifiable with doing <laughs> I know, I, I know. It was a particular interpretation <laughs> of, of the idea of personal freedom. But the idea was, you know, the, the idea of the Renaissance man is that they study the classics, that when you study the classics, you study languages, literature, history, philosophy, and et cetera, et cetera. In other words, 
So you're kind of set up by a classical education to do anything that you want. So when I got out, I got my PhD, and then I found that I had uh, uh, friends who were artists, mostly James Lee Byers and Eric Orr, who were constantly pestering me to write about their work. And I thought, well, why not? So one day I started writing about their work, and my phone has never stopped ringing. Since so it was really because of your friendship with these two particular yeah. people and try to engage in their work. Well, yeah, it was because of friendship. I'm going to come back to, to their work and to that aspect Please. of your work in a minute, but let me continue more on the line of the, right. the philology and go back to actually your magnum opus, uh, just published a few years ago, The uh, Shape of Ancient Thought. Tell a bit about the origin of that book and the, the concept behind it. And, well, when uh, I was I know many I, years in the in the making, right? I'd be happy. Many many years. When I was going to graduate school, I was you know taking Greek and Latin courses and other things and linguistics courses. And one of my actually the great uh, Czechoslovakian linguist Samarani was teaching that year. At, uh, and uh, where was this? At the University of Washington in Seattle, and he said that uh, uh, he he pointed out that it, it, in certain in Germany in the 19th century that a classical education meant Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit, and that Sanskrit had dropped out. But I I was intrigued by that, so I started studying Sanskrit on my own, and gradually this project of uh, I, I, it, it began to seem to me that I was having insights into both uh, Greek and Indian philosophy from reading the other one. So then it occurred to me to make a massive uh, conflation and comparison of them, and I started it when I was in graduate school, and the book was published 37 years later, and I worked on it in my spare time, off and on, more or less secretly, through that entire time. I mean, I didn't tell anyone I was working on it. I published some bits of it in journals here and there, but but basically it was just like a kind of a late-night private hobby, and then it finally really matured and, uh, and was published in 2002. Do you consider the thesis of that book controversial, heretical? Well, in some ways, it seems to be very controversial because uh, uh, well, basically, uh, the Western tradition has been based to a large extent on the idea of cre- keeping the idea of ancient Greek culture pure and of regarding it as kind of sui causa, like self-caused. And in, in my book, I'm, I'm devote a lot of chapters to arguments that the pre-Socratic philosophers were actually heavily influenced by Indian sources. So this is this is controversial in the West, but then at, at a later point in, in my book, in terms of like the uh, Buddhist school known as Madhyamaka, I tend to intr- attribute Nagarjuna's forms of argumentation to his encounter with some Western sources like Inesidemus or Sextus Empiricus, and this is equally offensive and controversial to Indian scholars. So you're saying that uh, there's, there's a, a transmission back and forth between India yeah. and ancient Greece during the, what ja- Carl Jaspers calls the Axial Period. That's the thing. What, I, what are the dates of that? that well, the Axial there? Age... Uh, uh, I mean, the essence of it is the 6th century B.C., uh, when from like 540 until uh, 499 B.C., northwest India and eastern Greece were in the same polity, that is, they were both in the Persian Empire, and that was when the great transmission of, first great transmission of influences took place. Then there was a later transmission of influences in the Greco-Roman period when the Romans uh, Developed uh, Indian trade very highly, and you know, the, the, uh, Carl Jaspers' idea of the Axial Age is that around the sixth to the fourth or third centuries BC, in other words, basically the 
archaic and classical Greek periods, that that was really when thought developed, but not just in Greece. He also recognizes its a very important, equally important development in India and also a, a, a kind of an echo of it in China. Anyway, the, I, I think that to me the, the reason, the point of calling that the axial age is it's the axis between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, which means essentially the Bronze Age was the age of mythological thought. People thought important thoughts through myths. But starting in the Iron Age, around 600 BC, people began to think abstractly. And it was a transition from mythology to philosophy. That's what axial means. There's also the invention of the alphabet at that time. Well, the alphabet, of course, was a, was already a present by about the 10th century BC, before the axial age began, in Phoenician contexts and elsewhere. But of course, the, uh, the Greek alphabet, alphabet was a, the Greek alphabet was an important uh, uh, technological aspect of the axial age. But still, I think the axial age would have happened without. Without writing, what's at stake in talking about this cross-cultural transmission? Well, uh, to me, it seems that what's mostly at stake is, is the uh, the self-understanding that cultures have of themselves in the aftermath or the wake of colonialism. And Western cultures, throughout four hundred years of colonialism, convinced themselves that they were superior to non-Western cultures. And non-Western cultures, in many cases, understandably, got a kind of inferiority complex or kind of uh, identity insecurity, and that's what's at stake. Like, uh, uh, the West has to acknowledge its sins in from the colonial era, and the rest of the world has to somehow come to feel free of the karmic burden that they laid on them. And this has a lot to do with clarifying the fact that philosophy, for example, developed equally in both Greece and India in the same period of years. And that as a matter of fact, as I think I've demonstrated in my book, and it was India that influenced Greece most powerfully. And that was... Uh, this is the post-colonial situation that, that has to be dealt with. Let me jump forward uh, to the, the present of the last 25 years, yeah. and yeah. specifically with this question, what, what does art have to do with it? To what degree is your – I want to come back to the, the point you just yeah. made, but to yeah. what degree is your engagement with right. classical – thought and also classical poetry informing your art criticism of the last 20 well, years? Well, it really has informed it a great deal. I mean, you know, I know, I know you've read a lot of things I've written, Charles, and you can see that... Uh, uh, I, I could have answered that question, but I thought, I thought it would be more fun to yeah, have you right, answer it. <laughs> right, I but, got my ideas about but, it. But, uh, you know, to go back to my, my original point about why I, why I bothered to get a PhD in classics to begin with, it's because the traditional idea from the Renaissance is that classics prepares you for anything. You can apply it to anything. You can use it to understand anything. And I've used it to understand both history and the history of art. And it, it, because, you see, postmodernism happened, and p part of postmodernism is postcolonialism. And that means that previously colonized nations are now going to be contributing their own voices to the discourse, so it's kind of the same structurally as commenting on comparisons between Greek and Indian philosophy. What is anti-art? Does that mean that you're against art? Well, uh, uh, the the way the term has been used, it it means what it means is that you're against the aesthetic theory of art which is the theory that was uh, invented by Plato and uh, put back in place and underlined and stressed for modern times by Immanuel Kant and then locked in place in the United States for a long period of time by Clement Greenberg. Let me, let me stop right there for a second because yeah. 
knowing that you're going to say something like this, but going back to the classical Plato, is there within the shape of ancient thought a non-aesthetic view that was articulated that Plato supplants, or does that only come later? Uh-huh. Or an well, anti-aesthetic view in well, your sense? I don't know. Anti- you, you, you say Pl- Plato locks it in. Yeah, Plato, one, Plato one. was an ex- extremely interesting thinker because he never just said one thing. He didn't want to ever get pinned down. And he is responsible for both the art and the anti-art positions, like the, 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 the position about the transcendental value of the universal beauty of art is expressed in the Phaedrus and elsewhere, and the anti-art position that uh, condemns art because it is an imitation of reality rather than reality, he enunciated in the 10th book of the Republic. So really, both the art and anti-art attitudes derive from Plato. He was an extremely interesting thinker in that he never wanted anyone to be sure what he meant. At a very practical and concrete level, can you give an example around the the turn of the millennium of what a Kantian or classical aesthetic position would be and what the opposite would be? Or what the the position that you articulate is? Yeah, well, basically... For someone who, who, who just doesn't know what we're talking about. Well, yeah, right. Now, well, basically, the, what I'm calling the Kantian view or the aesthetic theory of art and also or the Greenbergian formalist theory, what it means is that, uh, first of all, that the main value in art is beauty, with a capital B. Well, beauty is, I like to say beauty. What's not, that? Not beauty, but beauty. Beauty is, the way you pronounce it is beauty, right? Yeah. Not beauty, but beauty. That's a beautiful painting. I think <laughs> well, it's just so beautiful that I, my, my, something happens, my, my heart goes a patter. Well, but the question is, you see, like uh, on the Platonic, Kantian, Greenbergian view, this view I'm calling the aesthetic view of art, the idea is that beauty is a metaphysical universal and that either beauty is present in something or it isn't, and that you know that's the whole story. In other words, there's no relativism in it. Whereas uh, a postmodern, you see, that was the modernist view that that art is based on on universals of beauty and which can never change. The postmodernist view is that beauty is a relative value that is constantly changing from one time to the next and from one place to the next, so that it's not doesn't actually have a capital B. I'm, list, I'm talking to, and you are listening to, Thomas McEvely on WPS One's Close Listening. So, couldn't the same object be viewed from both these points of view then? Well, uh, you, depending, you know, the, in a sense, the question of whether there are universals behind our experiences doesn't mean anything because the fact is our experiences are the same regardless. It's just how we kind of interpret them. So that, uh, but but basically, you see, the view that beauty is guaranteed by certain metaphysical universals leaves it open to a kind of control and restriction. You see, like certain people can control them, uh, can control it. They can say, like Kant and Greenberg both did, I am in touch with the universals and I know what is beauty and any contrary opinion is simply wrong. Whereas from a postmodern relativist point of view, there can't be any such thing as a wrong position. If you like something, you like it. Do you think that right now, 2006, that's still an important fault line in the art world? Well, yeah, I think it is. I mean, uh, uh, one of the things that's been happening in in the last decade or so is a kind of gradual return of uh, the Platonic, Kantian, Greenbergian attitude and a gradual wondering of maybe, weren't they maybe right that beauty is a universal and that there can't be any variation from the universe. Now, I find this a, a very disturbing development. I would prefer, I think it would be much saner if we 
accepted subjectivity and relativism. But there is a certain tendency today for a resurgence of the idea of uh, metaphysical universals guaranteeing the value of the aesthetic experience. Can you talk a little about how you make this uh, engage these issues in your newest book, The Triumph of Anti-Art, Conceptual and Performance Art in, formation, in the Formation of Postmodernism, and some of the response that that and your recent work has gotten? Um, well, in the current uh, issue of New England Review, they, they've excerpted about 20 pages uh, of, of that book, and they, and they made a very nice choice, and they, they excerpted the uh, areas when I uh, discuss the transition from modernism to what we call anti-modernism to what we call post-modernism. In that, in that early chapter, really all these, all these things are sorted out as, as well as I can sort them out. And um, uh, by the way, my other <laughs> recent book, The Shape of Ancient Thought, which you mentioned, Comparative Studies in Greek and Indian Philosophy, it just got a fantastic long review, like 20-page review or essay in the journal Philosophy East and West, which is the best journal in the field. And another journal, the International Journal of Hindu Studies, has devoted their entire uh, current issue to uh, essays about my book. And uh, uh, anyway, maybe a moment is coming when... Because there wasn't initially that much response to no, that No, there wasn't. Do it, it, you it, think it, that there's something happening right now that's sort of well, making it, that it, more it, available, it, it, or just it, it's such took, a huge book it takes it time It took four to, years. So that's the uh, thing. I think, you know, the book was published in 2002, and finally this massive and great review came out in 2006. And as I waited through the years for such a review to come out, I was... Uh, I had I've suffered some anxiety about the issue of whether they would be able to find someone competent to review the book because it's very rare for a scholar to be competent in both Greek and Sanskrit and and you'd have to do that you'd have to have that to review the book but anyway finally philosophy east and west after 4 years came up with a fantastic reviewer for the book a man who teaches at King's College, Cambridge, where John Locke taught, and Ludwig Wittgenstein, and Bertrand Russell, and Quine, and so on. I mean, it's really the center of philosophical studies in the Anglo world. And they managed to come up with the perfect person to review it, and it took them four years to do it. And uh, I'm delighted about it. One of the things that brings together lots of aspects of what we're talking about is writing and your own engagement as a writer. Can you talk a little bit about your your book, North of Yesterday, another uh, aspect of your work that seems very significant? Yeah, North of Yesterday is, uh, well, well, it's what used to be called an experimental novel. We don't use that. I, I use the term poem novel. I, I know, I like to that. kind of come like up with that. something. N- North of Yesterday masquerades as a novel, but actually large sections of it are written in verse, in various verse forms. Actually, I meant it to be a kind of a compendium of verse forms, like some parts of it are villanelles, some parts of it imitate uh, archaic Greek lyric, and and so on. But, you know, technically, I think uh, what you, I love the term poem novel, and the old-fashioned term was experimental novel, but the really classical critical term is Manipian satire, where you know, the, the Manipian satire was an ancient Greco-Roman form where uh, prose and verse forms and different voices and styles were mixed up together in a kind of uh, aesthetic concoction. And that's what uh, North of Yesterday is. It's a Manipian satire that switches back and forth through different forms and styles um, of both prose and verse to tell a story that is uh, kind of classic death in the maiden tragedy theme. So extending from that interest in satire, poem, novel, going back to your early uh, 
rapturous engagement with Greek poetry. How does that aspect of being a writer and being concerned with the aesthetics of writing affect your art criticism? In what degree is your art criticism an extension of your literary engagements? Well, I always think of a, a piece of art criticism as a piece of writing. I always think of it as a piece of literature. And uh, uh, still, there is a difference. You know, like when, when uh, North of Yesterday came out, there was this wonderful review that the poet Robert Kelly wrote of it in which he said, this almost quinquagenarian <laughs> author, I would think I was like 48, 47 or something, so I was almost quinquagenarian. He said, this almost quinquagenarian <laughs> author has given us a young book. Well, the point is that I think I wrote the key passages of the book in 1967 yeah. and, and, and 1968, and then I worked on it now and then for many years and by by the time it was actually published uh my approach to myself as a writer ha had kind of changed i was more engaged in scholarly writing and more engaged in analysis and uh in other words at that early stage when i wrote the key passages of north of yesterday uh I wouldn't have been writing art criticism. But when you're writing art criticism, do you feel that the aesthetics, this kind of comes back to the issue of capital A aesthetics, not necessarily some universal idea of beauty, but aesthetics in the sense yeah. of aesthesis, yeah. the quality of the experience that you're engendering uh, when you're writing and for readers is part of what it is. So much of art criticism seems like uh, ad copy, catalog copy, uh, or yeah. just, just physical description right. without any yeah. aesthetic feeling in the writing itself, even though yeah. it's writing about aesthetic I always objects. feel that I'm writing uh, in, a, in an aesthetic way, uh, and partly because the, that quality of literature, which uh, poets have traditionally called the ear, has always been extremely prominent for me, and and this is true when I write art criticism as much as when I write poetry. That uh, it's got to agree with the ear. So it leads perfectly to my next question about the new program that you've started at the School for Visual Arts. Can you talk a little about that program in the time we have left? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Currently, it's April 2006, and this is the end of the academic year, and I started this program at the beginning of this academic year, in other words, in August of 2005, and uh, the School of Visual Arts asked me to establish and organize and then uh, administer a department of art criticism and writing, and I, I did so. Uh, I found wonderful colleagues to do it, uh, from uh, Donald Cuspid and Arthur Danto to Susan B. and Raphael Rubinstein, and uh, we have a lovely group of students, and the, the program seems to be going, so that whereas traditionally the, the profession of art critic has been kind of an amateur thing, you know, like something a lot of poets dabble in on the side, well, it looks like it's about to be professionalized, and this department is the beginning of that. I want to end on a, on a kind of a synthetic note in a way, uh, but just to ask you about an artist I know you've had a lifelong engagement to, James Lee Briars. And if I had more time, I'd want you to talk specifically about the difference between performance art, minimalism, uh, the object of art. Um, but in this case, I'd just ask you to talk about why James Lee Briars is important to you as an artist or might be important to us as an artist. Well, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's so much as an artist. I mean, for the last 10 or 20 years of his life, James Lee was uh, you know, more or less my best friend or one of my two or three best friends. And, and when I... My, the depth of my feeling for him is more based on friendship than on feeling about his art. But I did always love his art and always understood what he was doing. He died on 
May 19, 1997, in the Anglo-American Hospital in Cairo, Egypt, and I was at his bedside. I buried him in the American Cemetery in Old Cairo the next day, and um, uh, his artwork means a great deal to me because I know what it meant to him, and I've, I've written about it. Two, two of my books uh, have chapters about James's work from different points of view. One of them deals with James as a... Uh, performance artists in the other that, that's in uh, that's in this current book the uh, triumph of anti-art but and then in the previous book uh, sculpture in the age of doubt uh, is a chapter about James as a conceptual artist anyway I, I love his work but I, I have to say that uh, the bond between us was more than admiration of art. It was, it was just a solid friendship. You've been listening to Thomas McEvely in conversation at the Clock Tower Studio in Lower Manhattan. Our program was recorded on April 29, 2006. Close Listening is a production of WPS1.org in collaboration with Penn Sound. For more information on this show, visit our website, writing.upenn.edu slash pensound. This is Charles Bernstein once again warning you that the closer you listen, the more you hear.